My name is Gina Paulus. I'm the owner of Home Bodies and Home Fitness Training. I'd like to welcome you today to a special segment, a question and answer for the Home Bodies Fitness Show. So let's jump right in. This question came in on our Home Bodies Twitter page. How often should I be working out if I'd like to build muscle and lose fat? That is a really good question and it does depend on the person. The first thing that comes into play is how much muscle memory do you have? So if you're a person who has worked out many times in the past, then you can get away with a little bit less time because you're going to have muscle memory on your side. So even though it does vary, there are certain minimums that I'm going to say apply to just about everybody. So looking at building muscle, you're looking at at least twice per week of hitting every part of your body. So what that can look like is it can look like two full body weight trainings per week where you're hitting everything from head to toe in a routine. Now that sounds like a lot, but a lot of moves work more than one muscle at once. For example, if you're working squats for your legs, that's working your calves, your quadriceps, your glutes, your lower back, your core. So you can see that one move can actually be covering a lot of the body. So two full body routines can work. Some people that prefer to exercise more frequently might do, say you could do biceps, you could do that one day, you could do quadriceps the next day, you could do shoulders the day after that. So you could do things one by one, but the, still the same rule applies that you wanna be hitting those muscle groups at least twice every week, if not three times. So the thing with doing the split routines is you've gotta make sure that you're still hitting the frequency. So for example, some people like to do a push-pull split. So what they're going to do is any exercise where they're pushing away with whether it be with their arms or their legs is a push day and then the pull would be bringing something toward you okay so that can work well where you do say monday tuesday you do push on monday pull on tuesday and then push on thursday pull on friday so then you have a four days per week but it's really that two to three times per week that you're looking to hit every part of your body and for most people, the full body routine works fine. If you're trying to become a bodybuilder or you might be in a certain sport, you might need to do more days depending on what your goals are. So that would cover your strength building. Now, if, you're, if you have a really strong history of being in really great shape, you can actually maintain your strength with one workout per week. But the question was about gaining strength. So that is obviously more than just staying the same. But I just wanted to throw that out there because some people think it's not worthwhile to just do one time per week. But that does help you maintain, which is still great because otherwise you're going to get worse. You're going to get weaker, which is not what we want. So um, two to three times per week is great for that. As far as the fat loss goes, that really is an interplay between your diet and your activity levels. So for fat loss, you could theoretically lose fat without even exercising at all if you're eating a certain way. But this question was regarding working out. So let's assume that you're going to be working out, your diet is pretty good. So I would say three to five cardio sessions per week is great. Uh, two to three intervals. So interval training is where, for this purpose, the fat loss is going to be where you're taking it easy in between the bouts of sprints. So what that could look like is walking for five minutes, sprinting for one minute, and alternating those two. Something like that can be done two to three times per week to maximize fat loss. And then in addition to that, you can do what's called steady state cardio, which is going to be keeping a pretty similar pace. It doesn't have to be exact, but you're not doing a formal interval. So you're going for a bike ride and you're pedaling pretty hard, but you're not specifically sprinting, something like that. So that can be an additional two to three times per week. I do suggest one day per week of no cardio at a minimum. So, and the reason for that is because if you do cardio too, too much, your body does adapt and get a lot better at it, which is really great if you're trying to win a road race, but it's not so good if you're trying to boost your metabolism. So as far as the exercise beyond just the formal cardio, you could look at walking, and I'm not going to necessarily count that as the cardio for this purpose, but I'm talking about walking the dog, going for a stroll, something that's just movement, but it isn't 
maxing out on how far or how fast you can go, you can do that seven days a week. There's nothing wrong with that. That's actually really good for you. But we're not necessarily going to put that into the exercise bucket for this question. So moving on to the next question. If I'm looking to lose weight, should I use a protein shake? Well, it really depends on what the rest of your diet is looking like. So protein shakes are a food. They, I know that they seem like a supplement because they're in a jar and you buy them and you, it's a powder and all this. It's a food. So your protein shake should be replacing a meal or a snack. And it also should be part of your picture of your daily food. Protein shakes have calories, which is not a problem, but you have to understand that if you just drink protein shakes constantly and you're not reducing your calories, that isn't going to help you. So as far as the protein shake, because this question was about losing weight, obviously you can drink protein shakes to gain weight, which is another conversation. So a protein shake is great if you're using it to replace a meal that might have had more calories. And part of what's great about it is protein shakes have relatively few calories for the amount of protein that they have. So if I were to look at a food like an egg, it's got five grams of protein and 70 calories. So in order to figure out how much protein you have, you multiply four gram, uh, calories per gram. So that times the five grams of protein, which gives you 20 calories. 20 calories is protein for the egg out of 70, which is a third approximately. So a third of your calories are coming from protein, which is fine. You have to have fat in your diet and carbohydrate as well. But if you look at a protein shake, you might have 20 to 25 grams of protein at maybe 110 calories. So let's go with 25. 25 grams of protein times four is 100 calories. And if your shake only has 110 calories, you've got over 90% of your protein in that percentage for your shake, which means that it's easier to lose weight because you're getting the protein that you need to keep your body fat dropping as you keep your muscle on your body and you're also keeping the calories relatively low. So protein shakes can be really powerful in order to help you out with that goal. It is important that you choose the right brand. I'm not going to necessarily go through which brands I prefer here, but what you wanna do is look at what I was saying before with that example. So looking at 20 to 25 grams of protein, 150 calories or less is good. If you start getting into more calories, you're looking at more of a meal replacement product, which is protein plus carbohydrate and fat and maybe some fruits and veggies, which is all great, but it's just a different product. And most people don't necessarily need that because they're already getting meals that have the balance and they're really just looking for something quick. So as far as the question goes, if I'm losing, looking to lose weight, should I use a protein shake? I would say if it helps you to reduce your calories and manage your portions, fine. But if you don't feel satisfied by them and you don't like them, then eat something else. Eat some eggs, eat some chicken, eat some tuna. A lot of people find that one shake a day is good because it's a simple meal that they don't have to think too hard about. And that's a really great method for helping with weight loss is to keep it simple. So moving forward, the next question, what's the best way to keep boosting my metabolism? So when we're talking about metabolism, we're talking really about calories in versus calories out in regards to body weight. So what we need to do is look at what type of things can increase the calories that we're burning as the starting point there. So in order to increase the calories burned, you can look at how is your strength training plan? Is the plan hitting every muscle group two to three times per week? Is the plan using enough resistance to stimulate muscle growth? Muscles are extremely greedy for calories. They burn a ton of calories. So every inch of muscle you have on your body, you're gonna burn so many more calories. So making sure that the strength plan is intense enough is key. And I would say for most people, that's gonna be 12 to 15 reps at the most. If you can do more than 15, it's time to bump up the weight or the difficulty of the exercise. Other ways to increase calorie burn are going to involve the interval training that I mentioned earlier. So doing the sprints and especially making sure that the in-between bouts are slow enough that your sprint can be really, really fast because the only way to get the 
metabolism boosts out of your interval training is to make the sprint balls to the wall. It's really gonna be that hard. Otherwise, it's just cardio, which is fine, but it's really not gonna increase your metabolism for the next 24 hours like it would if you actually had a really, really strong sprint. The next piece I wanted to bring up is your daily movement. So I'm not just talking about getting up and going for a stroll or doing housework or anything like that, but there's actually been research showing that the people with the fastest metabolism fidget most. They're always, you know, tapping a leg or wiggling an arm or shifting around. They're always on the move. Now, unfortunately, this is generally something that's pretty personality based. People tend to be born with this trait and it can actually be up to a difference of 900 calories per day. I know that's huge. So I'm actually married to a fidgeter and he fidgets all the time. He struggles to put on weight and actually it's hard for him to gain weight, which I know sounds really annoying for a lot of people, but it's it really does have a, a benefit of if you're a fidgeter. So I know it can be tricky to get yourself to do this, but maybe setting a, an alarm on your phone to remind you, things like that can help. Even just getting up and taking breaks. If you're working on your computer or you're watching a show, can you be getting up and doing something in your kitchen, going back and forth, something where you're getting up and moving can help even things like foam rolling, doing your theracane, doing things like that, that are, you're not just sitting there, that can help. Um, when you're on the phone, if you can be maybe pacing your house or things like that. So you're basically creating an excuse to be able to move. The other thing you could do if you do some work on the computer, and I like to do this, I don't have a formal standing desk, but I do have some boxes that I put on my counter and I just put my laptop on there and I'll stand up and that can help as well. But you don't wanna just stand still. What you want to do is shift your weight to one hip, shift your weight to another, kind of balance on one leg, balance on the other, like move around. That's really the key to that. And then the last thing I wanted to bring up is hormones. So increasing your metabolism, burning more calories, you really want your hormones to be optimized. So that's going to start out with a visit to your primary doctor, making sure things look good, and through stages of life. It's going to be different when you're a teenager to when you're a young adult, to when you're a middle-aged adult, to the time of menopause and all of that. So you've gotta make sure that you have, you know, for a woman, of course, the menopause, but males have a similar shift in their hormones at that age as well. So what we need to look at with your hormones is make sure that things look good. Sometimes it does take an endocrinologist to dig a little bit deeper. There's also naturopathic and functional doctors who can look a little bit more deeply into your tests because sometimes the primary doctor doesn't look quite closely enough. They're looking at more the huge problem, the person who should be in the hospital compared to ideal. So it's one thing to be healthy enough to live and it's another altogether to have your ideal function. So that is worth pursuing. On top of that, there's little things you can do. So one of them would be to work on your insulin levels. So when your insulin is out of control, your body has a lot more trouble burning fat. And that's where we're getting more into the calories outside of things. How many calories are you burning um, with that? So if you can do certain things, it will really help your insulin levels. One of those things is to make sure that you go three to four hours between food intakes. So if you had maybe your breakfast at 8 a.m., you should not be eating anything else until approximately 11 or 12. And that's gonna be anything with calories. So black coffee is fine, tea is fine, but orange juice would not be. That's what we're looking at there. And then we want the three to four hours empty stomach in between your food. So that means if you're cooking a meal and you wanna taste what you're cooking, that's really not going to help you. Now, maybe that is just what you do at that one time of day and you might nibble on something at 4 p.m. while you're making your dinner and the whole rest of the day you're great about it. Okay, but again, if you're going for a maximal, I mean, I have clients who have done bodybuilding shows and things like that and they're not snacking in between meals. They're leaving their stomach empty because your body cannot burn fat when there's glucose in your system. I'll say that again your body cannot burn fat when there's glucose in your system. A cough drop has glucose. Uh, what else could, chewing gum might have glucose depending on what type it is. One packet of sugar in a tea has glucose. So you can really see how easy it is to get, to, to violate this rule. So I really like to tell my clients, 
eat when you're eating and stop eating when you're not eating. Just really make it really clear. And if you can train yourself to think that way, it does get easier with time. So that's one thing with the insulin. The other thing you can do is work on your cortisol levels because the higher the cortisol is, the harder it is to burn calories. And furthermore, it will increase the amount of fat stored in your abdomen. So for cortisol, we're looking at stress from exercise can increase it. So we just have to make sure that your exercise program is appropriate and you have built up to it in the appropriate time frame. The other thing that you can do with your cortisol levels is your general level of stress. So it's really hard, especially now when we're all living differently, but taking some time to be mindful, maybe lying on your back and meditating for 10 minutes. Maybe it's taking a nap in the afternoon. Maybe it's calling a friend that always cheers you up. Maybe it's playing with an animal. Things like that that you can do for yourself, they don't, they don't have to be really complicated. But things like that can be really, really helpful and just working on your breathing. So right here with me now, you can try it. Breathe in, try to take six seconds to breathe in. Hold your breath for one second and breathe out. Try it one more time on your own. Oh, look at this. We got what I just mentioned with my uh, cortisol. So I'm gonna get a little help here. But so the breathing, you just probably felt your body just soften and feel better. So that's a really powerful thing that we always have at our disposal in order to help us. So that is another good suggestion is working on your cortisol levels and then a really, really quick tip about cortisol is going to be alcohol and sugar, which I know everyone loves the alcohol and the sugar, but it is going to affect your cortisol. So I just suggest if you've got to do it, limit yourself to once a week because you can still have it. It's just a matter of how much. And if you can minimize the amount that you have, you're actually going to get the, be the best of both worlds because you do get your treat here and there, but you also can enjoy that extra fat burning that you're going to see the rest of the day. And you should make sure too that your pro processed and packaged foods that you might be eating don't have a lot of sugar. So I like to look on the label and check the added sugar and see how much is there because Added sugar, I mean things like spaghetti sauce, have it, cereals, even oatmeal packets if it's flavored. There's so many things. So even if you're not blatantly eating dessert and sugar, check out your labels because you might be surprised. All right, moving forward. What is a realistic schedule to implement activities for people with low stamina? This one came from Facebook. So I like for people that have low stamina to start out with strength training three times per week, but keep it short. So 10 minutes at a time is plenty. And a full body routine can be good. So something like push-ups, squats, and a bicep curl, you could do two to three sets of that three times per week. Now, as far as the cardio, we could do something similar. So the three days per week aside from that, so maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're doing your strength, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you're doing your cardio. So I'm going to say that the cardio, if you're going to walk, you could probably do 20 minutes, even if you have low stamina. But if that's too much, start less. It really doesn't matter where you start. It matters where you end. So it's important to start something that you can actually maintain so that you don't give up or that you don't get too sore and find that you can't do it. So start whatever you need to do to complete it, even if it's a three minute walk, whatever you need, because think about it in two or three months, how much better will you be at it at that point? It's really not a big deal where you're starting. It's that you have to just build it up from there. The next part of that question is what are some beginning activities and exercises for somebody with low stamina? So I just mentioned the walking. Walking is great. Bike riding can be really good. So those are the two that I would suggest for cardio if you're a beginner or you're getting back into it. And then as far as the strength training, push-ups against a wall or a countertop are really good for your arms. You can do bicep curls, which is going to be, you can hold some water jugs or water bottles and just you're coming up and down that way. So that if you're stronger, the water bottles aren't enough. You could always hold a laundry detergent if you don't have weights. That's great for the pulling muscles of the upper body and for legs. What you can do is stand in front of a chair and do some squats. And everybody knows how to squat because everybody gets in and out of a chair. So what you're going to want to do there is you want to stand in front of a chair. You're going to bend your legs, 
touch your hips to the chair and then press yourself right back up again. But instead of doing it just one time, like you would do normally in your daytime, what you wanna do is maybe five of them in a row and then you can progress to doing 10 of them in a row eventually and then 15. And then you can start holding weights to your sides as you do it. So as you can see, a lot of these fitness moves are really very similar to what you already do in your life and it doesn't have to be a big deal. But the difference with fitness and with regular life is that in regular life, what you're doing is you're doing a move one time, maybe two times, you know, unless you're doing something like shoveling, in which case it's a little bit more repetition. But even that, you're taking breaks or maybe switching where the type of angle that you're shoveling with. But in exercise, we're specifically trying to make our bodies tired. In normal life, you're actually trying to not make your body tired usually. Like if you're cleaning your house and you're getting sore, you're gonna take a break most of the time. But if you're working out, that's exactly when you don't wanna take a break and you wanna push harder. So exercise is more formal, more structured, and it has a systematic method to it. And the goal of exercise is to make your body basically break down. You're taking your muscles and you're ripping them apart. And you're doing that so that they grow back stronger than before. So exercise is gonna be something that's a little bit more purposeful. And yes, it might make you sore, but in the end, it makes you feel so much better. All right, so final question here. How much carbs should I be eating to maximize leanness without losing muscle mass? This question is a great one. And I know that with the keto diet being popular lately, everybody's focused on carbs and you've heard carbs are bad and I shouldn't have carbs and all this stuff. Our body does need carbs and I'm not going to go into keto and I'm not gonna bash it. If it works for you and you're able to work with a doctor who can make sure that you're staying safe with it, I don't have a problem with it. However, I don't see the need for the average person to go there with the keto. And the reason is it can get really complicated and it can get really dangerous if you don't follow it to the T. So what I like to do with people is I like to start them with a food diary and they're gonna fill in what their food is currently. And then I'm going to look for areas where I might be able to peel back their carbohydrate intake. So for a lot of people, they are eating carbs all day long. So what I'll do is I'll pick a meal that we can keep low carb. Maybe it's breakfast. Maybe it's that you, instead of having a bowl of cereal, you have a protein shake and you can have a piece of fruit, which does have carbs, but the fruit is not as, not the same as far as your body composition is concerned. So a piece of fruit has, it has a fiber and fluid and vitamins and minerals and not as many carbs as a slice of bread would have. So what we're doing there is we're reducing your simple carb and turning it more into the fruit sugar, which is a lot better for you for most purposes. So that is a good way to do it. And you can go through your meals. And ultimately I find that most people do best when they only leave one or two of their meals that they have carbs. And for a lot of people, I have a lot of my clients eating four meals per day with no snacks. So meal two, I'm sorry, meal three and four quite often will leave the carbs, but we'll keep them out of meal one and two. And the reason for that is that a lot of people, when they eat carbs, they start getting really hungry. So if you can prevent that from happening in meal one and meal two, and for some people even meal three, and then you have the carb in meal four, you don't have to be hungry all day long. Because for a lot of people, carbs make them really hungry. So what I'm saying here is we don't wanna go zero carbs, but we just wanna make sure that we're being smart about which carbs we're choosing and how much we're having and at what time of day. So in general, I find people tend to do best when they have more the later meal have the carbohydrate and it can be something natural like a potato or whole grain bread or something like that. But if you have a weird day where you end up wanting the carb in the morning or you have it for whatever reason, then maybe the dinner has less. So it's all about balance. So I would just suggest going through your meals and on the meals that you do have carbs, try to keep it to a portion of your fist is about the most you should have. And depending on the person, some people can have that two or three times a day and it's fine, but other people can only have it once. So you're gonna have to find what works for you. But I think that that's a good method. So just saving the carb for only part of the day is a better plan than just having it all day long. All right, well, thank you guys so much for listening and I hope these questions helped you out. And if you would like me to address any other questions in one of these future shows, please drop me a message on my Facebook page. It's um, the Home Bodies in Home Fitness on Facebook. You can find me there. So thank you so much and I hope that everyone has a great week.